sometimes when we ask, God knows uh, that no is the better answer. What happened was in that 100 days, uh, 1,500 people plus visited that cross for prayer. Welcome to the One Cry Podcast, a nationwide call for spiritual awakening. The goal, accelerating the movement of God through sharing revival truth, stories, and reports. And now, your hosts, Bill Eliff and Kyle Reno. Well, welcome once again to the One Cry Podcast. Uh, thrilling to have you today, and I'm um, Thrilled to be in here with Kyle Reno and I'm Bill Eliff. And uh, Kyle, we've been talking about all kinds of prayer. That's right. And, and you know, if if we want to have a united cry, right. one cry across the nation for revival and awakening, we need to get better at praying. That's right. And, and part of that is learning about the different kinds of prayer. And sometimes uh, we we don't have just because we don't ask and we don't <laughs> ask in faith, right? Yeah, right. Well, you see that. I, we were talking about this before we got started here. Man, when you look at Jesus and how he talks about 25 times, you know, that he talks about prayer uh, in the gospel specifically. And and it's really simple, you know, and, it, and it's very much coach you up. Yeah. yeah, it's like, hey man, ask, yeah. seek, yeah. knock. You know, it, and I'm gonna talk about that specifically. And I, I think, man, from the way it's like Jesus knows, hey, God can handle the, His will and yeah. how things play out. Yeah, you you do this part. You know, uh, it reminds me. I I had an uncle. He was uh, he was an uncle in law, and he was a gruff old construction worker, <laughs> right. but big old guy. And he just intimidated me. I was the youngest grandchild, and but he loved me like crazy. Wow. And and but I I never quite thought that. So one day he said to me, we were down in Warren, Arkansas, and he said, "Hey, Billy," I said, "Yes, sir." He said, <laughs> "He said, get yes, in, sir, <laughs> get in the truck. We're going to the toy store." And I thought, well, this is the last test. He's gonna, <laughs> he's gonna kill me, you know. And but anyway, I got in, yeah. and we go to the toy store, and he walks to the door, and he said, "Get whatever you want." And it just freaked me out. I don't wow. know. I don't know. I didn't trust him. Yeah. Wow. You know, and, and and I walked out of there with a 39 cent water pistol. I mean, for the last 60 years, <laughs> I thought, what were you thinking? <laughs> there's I could have bicycles, had a train set. there's BB guns. I mean, anything. Yeah. You would have bought me anything. Wow. But I just, I didn't, I didn't believe him. That I is, just didn't believe him. Man, know? that is a really good illustration yeah. about, remember what Bill just said yeah. as I unpack this passage. So what does Jesus say? Mm-hmm. Matthew 7. I'm going to unpack it a little bit. Famous passage of scripture. But man, hear the, hear the heart of God in this specifically about prayer. Now, now, granted, great big theological caveat that God knows best, <laughs> that God's will is right and perfect. God knows sometimes when we ask, God knows uh, that no is the better answer or not yet is going to play out with better timing or not that because God knows a better way. So absolutely, absolutely. Like, hey, bigger theological framework for the way that prayer works inside of the sovereign will of God. But hey, also remember. Jesus says this, ask and it'll be given to you. Hmm. Ask and it will be given to you. Let me, let, let me tell you where this lands in the life of, of Kyle Marino, a follower of Jesus. I am way less concerned about what I perceive uh, to go unanswered in my prayer life. I'm way less concerned about that. I'm way more concerned about the things that go unasked. I'm way more concerned about the things that God would have done, that could have happened, that transformation that might have played out in my life, family, city, church, nation. I I believe that that God wants to give more than we're asking for. I think that, that passage says it. I think that Jesus is saying there's more that God desires to do than we are currently asking for because he's a good father because he's a good dad that longs to do something i i I love this statement that katie and i have uh 
when it comes to life, <laughs> when it comes to moments, decisions, that there's this beautiful place of rest when we can say, well, at least we know, at least we know it's been asked. That's it. I mean, for me, okay, there's been so many times around pregnancy, around like home, or around future of a child or mom or situation, that there's this beautiful place of knowing in, in our spirit that we have brought it before our Father and asked over and over and over again. Second part of that says, asking to be given to you, seek and you will find. Man, I, I love this thought around prayer. Seek and you will find. Lord, in this situation, think about things you need to pray about. Think about things you need to lay before the Lord. In this situation, I'm seeking you. In, in this problem, I'm pursuing you. In this situation, I'm seeking you about it. In this problem, I'm pursuing you through praying about it. Prayer is one of the greatest ways to pursue God in what you're going through. Let me say that again. Prayer is one of the greatest ways to pursue God, to seek God in what you're going through. It's bringing anything and everything in the presence of God and seeking Him in it, seeking Him for it. Lord, I <laughs> this is an awesome part about seeking the Lord. He already sees it. That, that the Lord is not playing hide and seek with us. Uh, I, I think that the Lord is wanting us to seek so He can help. Seek so that he can help us. I can't tell you, and, and we've talked about this on this podcast before, I can't tell you how many times I've come into the presence of the Lord, into the prayer closet, into a prayer room, into a time of prayer with something that I just needed to seek the Lord's help. And before I left, I had it. If that might be the wisdom I needed for it, if that was perspective in it, maybe it was peace about it. Maybe it was the Lord giving me endurance to get through it that I sought the Lord in this and found him and found him. I can't tell you how many times are ahead of you in your life personally, where if you'll seek the Lord in it, you'll find him in it. You'll, you'll find that he will move, speak, do on your behalf in ways that will most glorify him. And let's do, will be good for you. Will be good for you. God never intended for us to seek a way forward on our own, but to seek it with him. Just think about that. God never intended for us to seek a way forward on our own, but to seek Him in the midst of it. Like, well, hey, Lord, this is a part of life. This is what's going on, so I'm going to seek you. And the bigger the, si si <laughs> the, bigger the situation, the longer we need to seek. I'm just, I mean, the bigger the situation that you're going through, the longer we need to seek Him in it. Hi, right, Lord, what do you say about this? What do you see in this? What, what's going on in this moment. Now, there's a couple perspectives. It says, ask and it'll be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and it'll be opened to you. Uh, the, the picture knocking, I really like that because it, it, it's some tangible effort. It's some tangible effort. You got to walk up to a door before you knock on it, don't you? I mean, you, you, can't, you can't knock from a distance. <laughs> you got you to gotta get to the door. You got to extend your hand. You got to make a knocking motion, and then you got to wait for somebody to open it. Like there's something, God. There's more to this illustration than just merely knocking. Like you got to get to the door. You got to knock on it. You got to wait for someone to answer. Let me tell you what I think prayer does. Prayer puts us at the door of possibility. Prayer puts us at the door of possibility. You got to walk up to the door. You got to extend your hand. You got to make a knocking motion through asking him. And you got to wait for someone to open it. And that someone is him. God is on the other side of whatever you're going through. And he can do anything. So let's knock. Hey, Lord, I'm right here. I'm at, I'm at, I'm what, I'm at what seems to be a wall. And I need you to make it a door. I'm at, I'm at what seems to be impassable, and I need you to make a path. So I'm standing right here and knocking. They call that faith. They call that faith in the midst of, of it. I, I remember just a personal story, and boy, I'll try to make it through this without being a hot mess. My wife stood at the door of infertility for 10 plus years. 10 plus years. That's the most helpless I've ever felt uh, as a husband. 
in anything. Let me, let me tell you what I can say about my wife. She never stopped knocking. She never stopped knocking. She had a promise from the Lord. And when everybody else told her, hey, that, that ain't going to happen, she never stopped knocking. She never stopped knocking. And one day, the Lord opened her womb. One day, the Lord opened her womb. And uh, she got pregnant with twins. <laughs> Well, that nowhere in our line. We were not trying fertility stuff at that point in our life. We did, we tried that years and years before, but the Lord opened. It, let me tell you what I think happened. Uh, that she had a promise from the Lord that the Lord let her wait at the door, and one day He opened it and He glorified His name. That listen, if if you wanna if you wanna see miracles in life, you gotta will, be willing to make your way to the door over and over again. You got you to keep on knocking, keep on seeking, keep on asking. And it says this, Jesus ends with this, For everyone who asks receives, and the one that seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. I say again, caveat. I know you can't build a whole theology on prayer one, around one passage. That's not wise to do with any scripture about any subject topic of our biblical theology whatsoever. But I do believe you can take one, one passage and start building your faith in how you're going to pray into the future, how you're going to pray into the future. And so, Bill, I know this, man, passage of Scripture is the Lord looking at us going, come on, man. Yeah. Come on, let's, son, daughter, step in, ask, seek, knock. Yeah. You don't have because you don't ask. Yeah, right. I mean, it's just so simple. Right. And I, I kept thinking while you were talking about... Uh, a great definition of faith uh, in Hebrews eleven six. Without faith, this doesn't work. It's impossible mm-hmm. to please God. And he who comes to God, and right. that's prayer, isn't it? Right. I mean, must believe two things: right. that God is. That's right. You say is he? He is everything. He's <laughs> wisdom. He's provision. He's protection. He's he is. I'm not. He right. is. Right. And he's a rewarder of those right. who just seek him. Yeah. He, I mean, what, what does God, yeah. you know, he has everything to gain right. by rewarding his right. children when, when they right. seek him. Amen. And he said, I just want you to believe this yeah. about me. Yeah. I, I, I really want to take good care of my Man, children, and I want to use you for my glory, but you won't believe me. Yeah. You won't come. You yeah. Know? Well, you, t- it's, well you mean, you're, you're just saying that in my own heart. I'm thinking, mm-hmm. man, will we take him at his word? Yeah. Will we take him at his word? Will we take that passage of scripture and go, God, I'm going to believe you. Yeah. I'm going to believe you no matter Let's let, let the mountain be cast into the sea. You know, I remember Stephen Kendrick uh, of the Kendrick brothers who all the Sherwood films and, and uh, Courageous and Fireproof, all that. I remember Stephen one time talking about big prayers. Yeah. I've got a, I've got a little spot in my prayer notebook that says big prayers. Yeah. These yeah. are just things that you think, okay, God, <laughs> yeah. it's not going to go unasked. No, and yeah. he, and and as he told that, uh, gave us that exhortation. He starts telling the stories about the making of those films, yeah. right? And just big prayers that God answered over and over again, specific prayers, right? And I, I just think the, you know, the world is waiting to see that mm-hmm. because when they see that, they see God. Yeah, right. So we're going to hear a story here, and uh, we, we want you to be encouraged by right. this, a testimony of, of uh, what God will do. Mm-hmm. Listen to this carefully. Well, hello, this is uh, Byron Paulus again uh, with One Cry, and I am so blessed today to have another story. Uh, revival does spread on the wings of testimonies, and uh, a fame of revival spreads the flame of revival. And I'm delighted today, by way of testimony, to have Pastor uh, Terry Long from Alabama. Uh, He's a state uh, mission director, I believe, in Alabama. Is that right, Terry? Yes. Great. And has been an inspiration to me personally and to literally hundreds and thousands of other pastors and those who share the burden that each of you share as a pastor, as you're listening to the podcast today, uh, to see God move but also to be open and available for God to even put something radical on your heart. 
to do in order to foster a spirit of revival in your community and even region of the country, but beginning in your church and in your own heart. So Terry, I was fascinated 10 years ago when uh, I read a story about this pastor down south somewhere. I didn't even know you, didn't know anything about this story, who uh, God just put on his heart uh, what I, we call, and a book by this title now, A Hundred Days at the Cross. So it's a prayer story. It's got, uh, it's, it's just punctuated with revival and revival truths and principles. So Terry, uh, just quickly, uh, tell us, if you would, how in the world, what that means, 100 days at the cross, number one, uh, how you got a vision for what God called you to do, and then just a little bit of the story of what took place. If you'd be willing to do that to our podcast listeners today, what a blessing it's going to be. Thank you, Byron. I, I'm thrilled to be on this podcast with you. You are one of my spiritual heroes, hmm. and uh, I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to share this story. This story changed my life. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I was saved as an er at an early age, uh, 16 in my high school. Um, and God just put his hand on me and called me to preach when I was still a junior in high school. Um, and so I've been privileged to be in some great churches, have some go great and godly men in my life who invested in my life. Um, but along the way, uh, I had pastored some churches that averaged 300 to 350 um, in, in attendance and then uh, ran into a hornet's nest in one of them and wound up out, out on my ear, so to speak. And then a little bitty church in South Mississippi contacted me the very next week and said, we don't have anybody to preach. Can you come? And I, I went and um, I really didn't. It was the kind of church you just don't dream of pastoring. I really didn't want to pastor this little church. It was 10 or 12 folks and it was in a, you couldn't find the place and it didn't have a good reputation necessarily. But but the Lord spoke to me five mornings in a row and said, I want you to go to this church just for me. Just go for me. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, I was there. I intended to go one Sunday and that was it. And I was there eight and a half years as their pastor. And we saw wonderful things happen. But at the end of that eight and a half years, um, I was burdened for my area, for my community, for my county. That was my home county. Um, and I was burdened for revival. Our churches were struggling. Many of them struggling to stay alive, stay afloat, keep the doors open. Um, some of them had closed the doors. And I began to cry out to God for revival in my own county. And it surprised me the day the Lord turned that prayer around on me and seemed to say to my heart, what I heard was, uh, why are you asking me? Um, uh, I'm looking for somebody with faith. I'm looking for somebody to step out of the box and do, what are you willing to do, Terry? And I remember being surprised by that question. And I, I said, Lord, I'm just a pastor of a small church in South Mississippi. I'm doing my best. And and the Lord said, why don't you, why don't you do something out of the box? Why don't you show me your faith? Wow. And I, I didn't know what he meant by that. So I said, what, what kind of thing would you ask me to do? What can I do? And that's when it came. It was as clear as a bell. Um, go out to a busy intersection and put a cross up and go out to that cross mm -hmm. and pray all day for a hundred days. Hey, I want to ask you in response to that, though, you were... You were really at a place of desperation from what I'm hearing you say. There we at go. a small church, you really didn't want to be at. And yet you were asking God, what is it you want me to do? But out of a heart that was pretty desperate. Yes, there's no question about the desperation of my heart. The more I prayed, the more desperate I became. And when he put this, uh, spoke this word to me about going out to an intersection, putting a cross up, going to that cross and praying all day. Hmm for a hundred days. Wow. That terrified me. Uh, I've never done anything like that before. I, I didn't know anybody had ever done anything like that. I've never seen or read or heard of anybody doing that. So, so you were brand oh, new. So just a minute. You were terrified. <laughs> what were you terrified of? Just some of the things that may have raced through your oh. heart at that point. Well, I actually thought number one, my family would probably be embarrassed my um, I thought people would, would be rude and ugly and, think I'm out on the you know side of the road you know doing what who knows what and 
I thought people would throw things at me, Byron. I thought people, yeah, right. yeah. I, I know that area of Mississippi. I, I just thought people would yell, you know, curse me out, yell. I thought my ministry was on the line. I thought if I did this and failed, mm. my ministry was over. And I had to come to the place where I was willing to risk that, to step out just on the word that God had given me. So really fear of rejection, fear of <laughs> failure. Yeah, I didn't know if I had the stamina to do that. I'd never prayed all day about anything. Yeah. So I wasn't, it wasn't like I was a great prayer warrior or anything. So, but you know, as I, as I tried to push that out of my mind, this is where I began to realize there's something to it. What I've learned about the voice of God is that God is never pushy, but he's persistent. Wow. And he will, if it's from him, he's just not going to go away. Uh, you can ultimately reject him and, and he'll go on to somebody else and use them. But but I know I knew, finally came to the place where I knew that it was God. And I asked the Lord for supernatural confirmation. I said, if I know, if I know this is you, I will do this, but I've got to know it's you and not me. So I asked the Lord for confirmation and supernaturally, no way he could have done it. Uh, humanly speaking, he gave that confirmation at the last minute. So I got up and announced to my congregation uh, on Sunday morning, um, January the 22nd, I announced to my congregation what I'd be doing. And, um, and immediately there was a spontaneous move of the spirit in our congregation. Wow. Three men got up from different areas of the sanctuary and made their way to the platform and stood one behind the other and just put their arms around me and wept. I'd never seen that before. Now, somebody joked later that uh, they were probably all on the finance committee because one of the things the Lord told me to do was turn my salary back into the church for those hundred days and then to fast for the first 10 days and pray and then uh, to shut down my construction business and take no income from either the church or my construction business for those hundred days. So somebody joked that they were probably all on the finance committee and were so elate, elated they were going to get my salary check back. Um, but that wasn't the case. These were men that were moved of God. And um, so the next morning I was out at this intersection. Uh, uh, 2,200 cars passed by every day. And I was in one corner of that intersection, kind of, uh, you know, 50 yards off the highway. It was a four, uh, it was a four lane going north and south. And, a two lane crossing um, and a red light there. And uh, I had two met, two of my men build the cross and brought it out. It was 14 feet tall, seven foot cross beam. We put it in the ground and they prayed with me and left. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't know what to do, but just to pray. And I would kneel and pray. I had a little folding chair and then I would walk around the cross and pray. Mm -hmm. Two hours later, things began to happen. I got a phone call from a man in a town two hours away, said, I've heard about the cross you put up. Can I come bring my congregation to pray at that cross? This was a Methodist pastor mm -hmm. wow. from, from Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And I thought, how did he know about this? And a little while later, uh, two ladies in a car pulled off the road and came down and wanted to know what I was doing. And I said, God just asked me to come out here and pray for people. Can I pray for you? Is there something I can pray for you about? One lady said, well, my daughter is on drugs and I'd like for you to pray for her. The other lady said, my son is in jail and I'd like for you to pray for him. So I grabbed a notepad off the seat of my truck. I grabbed a pen. I, I grabbed a hammer and a box of nails out of my toolbox. And I walked that out to where those ladies were standing at the cross and asked them to write those names down. And I asked them to, to go put their prayer request on the cross. So that was spontaneous. But it began something that happened. There were, by the time those hundred days were up, there were so many uh, prayer requests nailed to that cross. One, one newspaper reporter said it looked like the cross had sprouted angel feathers. There were so many white pieces of paper all the way down that cross. What happened was in that hundred days, uh, 1,500 people plus visited that cross for prayer. Um, that's just the ones that came in the daytime when I was there, I would get out there at six o'clock in the morning, stay till about four or five o'clock in the evening, go home. Um, 23 of those pe people I was able to lead to Christ at the foot of that cross. Uh, seven more got saved within a week after those hundred days were done. And 
people are still going to the cross 10 years later. It's still there. Wow. The county now maintains it, and they have officially deemed it a holy worship site. Amen. I, Amen. Kind of blew my mind when they did that. Wow. But the sheriff told me that because there was a guy that came out and tried to set fire to the cross three times hmm. at night. Um, and they arrested him the third time. He never could get the cross to burn. There's still char marks on the cross. Wow. But he was angry with God because his wife had died of cancer. And he was going to get back at God by burning that cross down. Mm -hmm. As it turned out, I asked the sheriff when I called, I wanted to go see the man and share Christ with him. But he was in a, he was in a um, mental, mental ward and locked, locked me in. I couldn't see him. But I asked the sheriff, what did you charge him with? What was the official charge? And he said, desecrating a holy worship site. Huh. So now that the county yeah. maintains the grounds around it, people are still going. I went there about a month ago and, and put a fresh coat of paint on the cross. And there were 13 new prayer requests nailed to the cross 10 years later. Wow. I, I can't tell you how that's changed my life. Um, some of the stories, and I've documented all of this in the book, 100 Days at the Cross, because I, I would tell the story in a church, and I could only get two or three of the stories out of people being converted. But I had pastored 34 years at that point, and I had never seen, ever seen the kind of dramatic conversions experiences that I saw at that cross, and it, it just stunned me. And I asked the Lord one day, I said, why am I not seeing this in my church? My little church was 15 minutes away. And I got an answer, Byron. Mm. The Lord said, it's because my church has forgotten the cross. Gotten too sophisticated, too high tech. And it's the cross where the power is. Wow. So for those hundred days, I, I did nothing but read about the cross, preach on the cross, I lived, ate, and breathed the cross of Christ for a hundred days. Wow. Basically did what Isaac Watts said, when I survey the wondrous cross, not when I glance at it, but when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gains, I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Wow. It was a life-changing experience and continues to change my life to this day. Wow, Terry, that's an amazing story of obedience surrender, uh, sacrifice, uh, but more than that, an amazing story around the cross. In Connecticut, there's a church that uh, talks about it in a book entitled On a Hill Too Far Away. Oh, and wow. they, they put in concrete inside their auditorium in front of the pulpit a cross. So no matter what happens on that stage, people are having to look through the cross, around the cross. The cross is in the way. I love it. And I'm just thinking, that's exactly kind of what God led you to do there on the highway. So, Terry, would you just briefly yet here at the end of this uh, little interview, would you pray especially for pastors and Christian leaders that God would give them um, what God gave to you to not your glory, but his glory, the kind of heart of radical obedience? Would you do Absolutely. that? Just the next, the next Absolutely. Week? Father, I thank you for Jesus. Yes. I thank you for the cross of Christ. Everything that was necessary to take care of my salvation and the salvation of the world occurred on that cross. You took care of it. You, were, you paid the price. It is finished. And we know that the resurrection was necessary, but the resurrection was simply God's amen to what Jesus had already accomplished on the cross. And I thank you for it. So, Lord, as we go from this meeting and we go into the world and share the good news of the gospel, help us to know that we haven't shared the gospel if we don't talk about the cross and the resurrection, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Help us to be gospel-centered, cross-centered, because that's where the power is, Lord. I, I, I thank you, as, as John Stott said, the cross is the blazing fire that's right. uh, at which the, the flame of my love is kindled but we have to get close enough for its sparks to fall on us. Keep us near the cross, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Terry, thank you so much. And uh, 
Lord willing, we want to post online uh, 100 Days at the Cross, the book, so that our uh, listeners can go deeper in what it is God asked you to do in your obedience. Thank you so much. Thank you, buddy. Well, Kyle, uh, this just really challenged my heart yeah. uh, today to ask, seek, and knock. Yeah. And we need to do that. And so let's, uh, we always love to end our time by praying. Mm-hmm. And we want you to join in with us. Maybe yeah. there's some big prayers that yeah. you need to, you need to ask out about right yeah. now. You may, we're going to pray, but you may yeah. need to personalize that right where you're listening and, mm. and as you pray with us. So, let me begin, Kyle, you close our yeah. prayer. Father, uh, thank you for this simple reminder. Right. Uh, you're, you're just trying to spur us on. Just mm. ask, seek, knock, yes. and keep on asking and keep yes. on seeking and yeah. keep on knocking. And, and Lord, to believe that you are a rewarder yes. of those who seek you. Lord, we just want to say we believe today and help our unbelief and uh, teach us in prayer to ask big things of you and expect great things and Mm. attempt great things, Father, uh, to show the world that you're a prayer hearing and a prayer answering God. Mm. Lord, I I pray for our friends uh, even today on this podcast. God, I I pray that someone would ask again, Mm -hmm. that someone would seek today. Uh, Lord, that someone would walk up to the door of whatever problem or impossibility and they'd knock. Right. They'd knock and say, Father, would you please do this very specific thing? And Lord, I ask for your glory and for their good that you would move some mountains. Mm-hmm. God, that you would break through some walls. Uh, God, that you'd lift up some low places and you'd bring down some high places. God, that you would move, Lord, because you are a prayer hearing prayer answering God, and that would bring about life change, uh, Lord, in in someone's life even today, maybe even a city or a church's uh, life today, Lord God, and it would bring you the most glory. So God, I I pray that we would be totally fine with looking crazy in this world Mm -hmm. because we we make total sense in the kingdom of God. So Lord, we love you and entrust our lives to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us and encourage others to listen to these podcasts. You can uh, like it or send the link to somebody and uh, either by video or audio and then join us next time. We we have a lot more to talk about in this Mm -hmm. series on all different kinds of praying. So thanks for joining.